This is the Facebook page of the Arvada Police Department in Colorado. Arvada Police received a missing person report on February 26th about subject Terrence Parks, age 24. He is described as six feet tall, 175 pounds, brown hair, and green eyes. Parks has been missing for several days. Now, if that wasn't concerning enough, obviously in that description, we don't have any type of clothing description, but he's also missing with a vehicle. Is there something that we can do to help Terrence Parks' family find the truth of where he is? It's time to turn on the searchlight. Hey everyone, John Lorden here. Thank you so much for joining me on another episode of Brain Scratch Searchlight. Today's episode, we're going to look into the case of Terrence Parks. Um, we're also going to do an update on the Zayla Walker case. That's one that I covered towards the end of 2018. We have an update there. Unfortunately, she hasn't been found. If you guys remember that episode, it's a case that doesn't look really good. Plus, how people that support me through PayPal and Patreon are helping other children across the world. So stick around for the end of the episode to learn more about that. But let's go ahead and get into today's case, starting with figuring out Arvada, Colorado. I wasn't familiar with this area when I started. Arvada is in Jefferson and Adams counties in Colorado. As of the 2010 census, the population was over 106,000 people. And in 2016, the estimated population was over 117,000. Certainly sounds like a growing community. Ranking Arvada as the seventh most populous municipality in Colorado. Here at fox59.com, uh, I brought up a picture. These pictures are the most often circulated with this case, so I'm assuming that they're a bit more recent. I did find a Facebook for him, but it looks like he stopped using it around 2014, if I recall correctly, and he looks quite a bit different. So these are really the images that I want to also um, help the family with by by putting out there. And we have a really interesting development in terms of the GoFundMe on this case also. Uh, we're going to get to that, but let's continue by learning some of the details here at Fox 59. Police in Buena Vista, Colorado are searching for a missing man from Greenwood. Uh, I checked a map and I could find one area that mentioned Greenwood. It's just south of the center of Arvada. Family of Terrence Parks say the 24-year-old moved to Colorado from Indiana last year. He's a graduate of Center Grove High School and Ball State University. Parks reportedly advised his friends that he was going snowboarding in the mountains, so family say that's where they're focusing their search. Um, and that's one of the tricky aspects of this. First of all, we have a car that's missing with him, which is a huge concern. We don't have a solid clothing description, which is a problem. When you're looking for a missing person, usually you can at least get that description out there. So people in the area that might have seen him at around that time can say, oh, yeah, you know, I, I remember that particular logo or I remember that particular hat or color. We don't have any of that. And this with this angle that he was going snowboarding, uh, he did mention to his friends one particular place he was going to go snowboard, snowboarding, but it looks like he was traveling to several other places. So I don't know if he was checking out different sites. So even in terms of where he was last known to be, we've got some information, but it's based on a phone call. And we don't know if that is truly the last location before whatever happened to him happened to him. So um, let's go ahead and continue trying to pull this story together. Jumping over to an Instagram post that I found, um, this is not his actual car. This is a stock image, but this is the type of car that he drives. It's a 2001 bronze Buick LeSabre with Colorado license plate SD04555. And in this post, um, Melanie Star 88 says he was last known to have checked into Best Western Hotel in Buena Vista, Colorado on Sunday night, February 24th. So it's kind of weird because I've thrown a lot of different locations at you, but this is the best information we have in terms of where he was last known to be. And that's actually in Buena Vista, Colorado. So he told his friends he was going to go skiing in the Breckenridge area, but he actually, his last known position is in at the Buena Vista 
area. So, and that's, there's about a 60 mile difference between those two places. Uh, you know, obviously just an hour's worth of driving, but pretty big difference in terms of trying to form a search party or get people out there to look for him. So a lot of challenges when it comes to um, trying to look into this case. I can't imagine what the family must be going through in all this. Over at 9news.com, the police department received a missing persons report on February 26th about Parks. So I, I just wanted to reiterate that we've got a little bit of a lag. 24th is when the last contact happens. 26th is when the missing person report is actually filed. But then we've also got this problem with all these different potential areas that he can be in. And are these departments all coordinating in some way? I'm sure the information for that missing persons record is getting across to them. But in terms of putting search parties together, really knowing where to look, this is one of the toughest cases that I've seen. Uh, his mother told the police department the last contact with Parks' phone was in Buena Vista. So once again, just more information supporting what we found over at the Instagram post. And here is a post at Facebook. It's my Colorado family and friends. This is Terrence Parks. He's a coworker of mine. He's currently missing. A missing persons report was filed by his family either Monday or yesterday. Uh, here they're saying the last known communication is February 22nd. I think they have that wrong. I've seen several other sources that are saying it was actually the 24th, but they're once again saying uh, Best Western in Buena Vista, Colorado. And here they're also noting a few other places. In the few days prior to that, he was known to have been in Gunnison, Breckenridge, and Boulder. So let's jump back to the map. Um, Breckenridge, I've already showed you. Gunnison is down here, so even further west and a little bit south of Buena Vista, but Boulder is way up here. So um, it's kind of, I don't know if, if someone's going to go skiing, I don't do this. So I'm going to have to ask you brain scratchers out there to comment about this in the, in the comments down below. Uh, if you're a local in this area and you're looking to go skiing, are you really going to jump across four different places to do that? Is there some reason why, I don't know, some of the slopes might've been closed around this time of year. Maybe weather was too bad at some of them and he kept moving from place to place to try to find that one that was open. I, I'm asking you guys for help on that because I don't understand um, why he would be at so many different locations like this. And it's just, obviously it's very tough to um, to try to help when we, we don't even really have a solid last known location. The best thing we can say is he was at this hotel, but you know some of these locations are just an hour away. So could he have checked into that hotel and then wound up driving somewhere else to try to go skiing? Um, and it, it almost occurs to me that that must be there must be something like that that's happening with this case, because I would assume the missing persons report has been sent out to the local police departments for the areas where he was known to be. I'm wondering if he went to an area that hasn't been reported back to have been a known area, and maybe that police department doesn't exactly have this case on their radar. So um, if, if you live in the Colorado area, please, please share this video. Let's raise exposure to this case and try to get his face seen by more people, because this is a case that really needs that, that type of coverage. We don't know where to search. We know there's a car missing. We know there's a man missing. And I don't, it feels like the right places haven't been notified of, of the, the fact that he is missing and the car that they should be looking for. Uh, and a little bit of good news, if you could really say that about this case, uh, we do have uh, over at denverpost.com police commenting that the Arvada police said they don't have any evidence to indicate suspicious circumstances. Um, and obviously we have really little information in this case, so I would agree with them. We don't have a whole lot of backstory. I mean, he moves into the area a year before, maybe he's not exactly familiar with, um, the types of dangers that could occur in terms of driving around that area, uh, in terms of being out in the wilderness at that time of year around that area. I mean, we're coming up on a month now that he's been missing. So certainly a lot of cause of concern that there's some potential for an accident of some kind to have happened here. Um, also some potential, maybe he would have run away from his life for some reason, but we really don't have a whole lot of backstory or understanding to, to really put together a good 
theory on that whatsoever, outside of the one little tidbit that he just moved to this area a year before. Was there some reason for that move? Was he getting away from the last place and then he didn't like this place and now he's getting away from there? But why would he separate from his family? Are there some other dynamics that we're not aware of in this? I don't know. I'm just trying to go through the possibilities. There's something in my gut that I kind of feel like this is a situation where there might be some type of accident, in particular because we have that vehicle missing. We have the cell phone that has been sh either shut off or has run out of battery. Um, really, really concerning. And I'm just, I'm hoping that someone out there can help with this case. Uh, by the way, I have contact information in the description box below. If you do have any information, please use that. Please call it in and let's help this family with this. Moving on to WTHR.com. Family suspends GoFundMe for missing Center Grove grad after new development. And this is part of the reason why I wanted to cover this case. So let's let's go ahead and, and see what has happened first. Uh, a GoFundMe page was set up to help Parks' family cover lost wages and travel expenses to help search for him, but the family suspended donations on the page Sunday. People had donated more than $19,000 in just two days. Let me first say, if there is a true bright spot in this story, it's that. I am always moved when I see communities rally around people that need help. $19,000 in two days is amazing. Um, and think of the resources. I mean, that's enough to, if, if this was a case where you needed a private investigator, they should easily be able to retain a private investigator. Uh, they should have no worries about printing flyers, making t-shirts, putting together vigils. I mean, that is a, such a substantial amount of money. Usually for these cases, we'll see a GoFundMe maybe hit $5,000, something around those lines. So it, it's very obvious that a lot of people are concerned here. Now, why would the family have shut it down uh, when it was doing so well, and quite honestly, you never know how long these cases can go on. You might need years of support um, to, to truly find the answer in this case. So why turn it on? Why have it so successful? And then why shut it down? We can learn more about that by actually going to the GoFundMe. Good morning, friends and family. We have a significant development. We have a credible sighting of Terrence alive. A restaurant manager several hours away reached out after seeing a news report about Terrence's disappearance. He believes he saw and talked to Terrence a few days ago. The report appears to be very credible, but has not yet been confirmed. Um, first of all, I think this is pointing kind of to what I was talking about, the possibility that he is actually outside of the area that they've been looking in and, and not in an area where they necessarily had... Um, good information that he might have been. And I'm kind of interested in why they won't actually say what that area is so that uh, people like me can get that area out there, get more eyes open. Um, maybe they're trying not to call too much attention to this if they do think that he's on, that he's running away from something himself or something along those lines. Um, but I think he's still missing. And this is a post from over two weeks ago. I think it's time to maybe take some other steps just in terms of getting information out there. That's why I'm filming this, but let's continue with more from the GoFundMe here. As a result of this news, the search strategies are changing. The working theories are shifting away from something accidental and the search area has been significantly increased. Although the promise that he is alive is obviously the more, most important thing, the reality is that he has not been found. The search will continue until he is home safely. The family has decided to suspend the GoFundMe campaign until we better assess their needs in light of the development. They were completely overwhelmed with the generosity and support of the community and believe that the funds available now will help them manage search costs, travel expenses, and help for Terrence after we locate him. The outpouring of support and love has been a blessing to them this week. Now, Margie Lawyer-Smith is who's managing this. I believe she is a friend of the family's. Uh, I did shoot out an email to her earlier today. I haven't heard back from her yet. If I do hear from her and we get some better details, I'll do an update segment in next week's Searchlight about this case in particular. Um, but one of the things I wanted to talk about with this is First of all, is it really a good idea to shut down the GoFundMe when you have substantial support coming in and we don't have him located yet? I don't know. Uh, personally, 
I don't think that's the best move. I think that they should leave it open, um, but not actually take any of the money out of it. People can refund the GoFundMe. So essentially, I would have left it open. I would have, I would have let it continue to increase and grow because, like I said, you, you have no idea how long this can go on and what type of state is he in. There's a little bit of a hint there that he might be going through something um, that he might need some help with. And as long as they're being upfront about that, I think it's a good thing to actually let the GoFundMe go because not only are the people investing here to try to find him, I, I feel pretty confident that people are putting money into this to make sure that he is found and that he's well and that the family has what they need to go through this trying time. So I don't know that shutting it down is necessarily the best thing. Um, and in particular, I'm personally concerned because I can't tell you of, you know, I look into a lot of longer term missing persons cases and I speak to the families involved with those. And in practically all of them, there is some sort of sighting that happens. Now, what I'm hoping here is they're talking about a restaurant manager. I'm hoping that that restaurant had some type of surveillance. I'm hoping that the surveillance could have gotten back to the family or at least to law enforcement. Maybe they took a snapshot and showed it to the family. But I have even seen a few cases, not a whole lot, where that has happened and the information has proven out to actually be incorrect. It's someone that looks like the person that is missing. So it just, I'm really concerned for the, for everyone that's that's trying to deal with this at this point. And I just wanted to raise exposure to this case, bring you guys into it, ask you to share this throughout the Colorado area. I really wish we knew where this restaurant was because I think it would be really helpful to get that information out so we can kind of focus the search around that area a little bit. But that's pretty much it for the press on this. There is no further information about this case. And on top of that, um, we don't have a NamUs profile. And quite honestly, I don't even have enough information to enter a NamUs profile. Now, this is a case that's less than a month old, so there's a possibility that a profile has already been started, but it hasn't been approved by the team at NamUs yet. Uh, if any family or friends of the family are watching this, if you don't know if that has happened and you think that this is an important step, please feel free to contact me, john at lordandarts.com. I will help you guys get this record entered. I just need a few more pieces of information to be able to do it myself, or I would have just done it myself here as it is now. Um, it's, it's one of those things that's really important that he's in NamUs if we are considering the potential of some type of accidental situation. Uh, just for people that aren't aware, NamUs has two major components, the missing persons database, but they also have an unidentified bodies database and they work with each other to try to make identifications. Hopefully that unidentified body has a missing persons record and sometimes DNA connects it. Sometimes it's just the simple vital statistics, the area where the, the unidentified body is located, approximate age, clothing description, things of that nature. So uh, it would be very smart, I think. In particular, if we're, if we're not con completely convinced about this sighting of him, I think it'd be smart to get him entered into NamUs because I have also seen where the missing person record doesn't come into NamUs until after the unidentified body gets identified. And it kind of seems to delay the process of those um, being located together. I've seen that happen even within uh, law enforcement divisions where they'll find the unidentified body, but the missing person record hasn't been filed with them yet and they have no idea who it is. And just because of the order of those events kind of coming in backwards, sometimes it takes them much longer to make the connection about, oh, this is that person. You know, we were sitting on this record and we had no idea. So I think the sooner we get them into NamUs, the better. And like I said, family or friends out there, I just need a little more of his personal information and we'll, we'd be able to make that happen. Uh, in the links below, I will also include a web sleuths thread. It's only one page long, but if you want to join the conversation, you can there as well. And I'll have a link to his Facebook account. There wasn't a whole lot of info. You know, that's something that I really think there is value in uh, when I'm covering these cases is being able to talk about the person on a little bit of a personal level. What are their likes and dislikes? Um, sometimes that information can give us some hints in terms of what they might be doing, what they might gravitate towards, where they could possibly be going. 
in this case, we just don't have a ton of that type of information. Um, I couldn't even find like a clip of a family member discussing this case to start this episode. So there's a lot it feels like that can be done in terms of um, helping to progress this case. When I did reach out to the family friend, I also shot a link, but if anyone else happens to see this, look in the description box below and there's a link to a um, website called Brain Scratchers and that's where I have my missing person tips. And I've put together all the best information I can find from multiple sources and all the cases that I've looked into all in one place. There's videos there, there's written text there, there's a ton of great ideas for helping to progress cases just like this. So I hope that you will find that helpful. All right, what's the big update with the Zayla Walker case? Kind of a heartbreaker because it's turning out to look like what we were worried about all along. Um, I'll have a link to the original episode down below, but for anyone that's just coming into this story, this is a very strange occurrence where um, it seems like Zayla's parents kind of didn't flee the country, but they went bouncing around the country and did eventually cross the border into Mexico. They did eventually come back to Las Vegas. There was some strange things that have happened along the way. No one saw Zayla while they were on that whole trip. And now we're having some developments in this case. And it's kind of interesting because I know there's a lot of missing persons cases out there where a body isn't found. And because of that, law enforcement can't really progress or you know they can't be prosecuted. Well, this case is going a little differently. Parents of missing North Las Vegas girl charged with murder held without bail. The parents of Zayla Walker, a missing three-year-old from North Las Vegas, were being held without bail after a Monday morning court appearance. The couple was charged in her murder on Friday, according to the North Las Vegas Police Department and court records. Zayla's mother, Lakia Walker, 27, was booked in jail Friday. Her father, Zayla's father, Ricky Beasley, also 27, had a murder charge added and was rebooked as he was already in custody for kidnapping a child and for stealing a car. According to an arrest report filed in the case, Beasley was watching Zayla at his home August 21st. About 11.30 or midnight, Beasley's mother was sleeping in her room, which shares a wall with Beasley's bedroom, the arrest report said. She was awakened by a loud thud from Beasley's room. She got up and met Beasley in the hallway where he was holding Zayla, who was crying. He said Zayla had just urinated all over herself and he had gotten angry and thrown a cot against the wall causing the thud. After giving this explanation, Beasley took Zayla into the bathroom to give her a shower. The report said that would be the last time anyone other than Beasley or Walker would see Zayla. So this article continues. I'm going to have a link to this down below as well. There's a lot of additional details. Many of it or much of it we've already gone through in the first episode, so I don't want to completely retread it here. There's a few other odds and ends, but they don't seem directly pertinent to the case of where this little girl is. Um, it's, it's a terrible outcome. Unfortunately, it's the one that we feared right from the get-go in terms of looking into this case. And I'm still hopeful at some point someone will do the right thing and just speak up and say where this little girl is so that she can be given a, a proper memorial because um, right now it doesn't look like there's a good chance of that. And now... It's just a question of, are these parents going to keep protecting their own interests or are they going to do what is right in this case? And I really don't know which way it's going to go. Before we end today's episode, I wanted to share an email with you guys that I got from a company called Destiny Rescue. Now, I haven't talked about Destiny Rescue a whole lot in a while. Uh, seems like about once a year, and it's about that time of year where I should. Uh, Destiny Rescue is an amazing organization that is fighting child trafficking internationally. And by supporting me here on the channel, um, by supporting me through PayPal, by supporting me through Patreon, we continue to support Destiny Rescue. We've basically set up an automatic payment that has been going to them monthly since I believe it was January of 2018 that we've actually started doing it. And I just wanted to share this message that they sent with you guys. Dear John, your monthly support mobilized agents in a recent raid that set 10 girls free. This is a text from Alex, an undercover rescue agent, about the raid that you, that includes you guys, made possible. 
My role was to be the first guy to buy the children. The pimp walked me upstairs to the room where I was told to wait and relax. I positioned the hidden video camera bag on the table to ensure everything that took place in the room was caught on film. As I sat there, I could feel my heart pounding in my chest, knowing there were 10 precious little lives on the line tonight. It was essential I got the money exchanging hands and confirmation from the pimp she was selling me the girls for sex. As I sat there waiting, I turned on my other hidden camera to get a second angle. Two confident 15-year-olds and a 17-year-old walked into the room. Two sat down beside me, and the third sat on a stool opposite me. Moments later, the pimp walked in with the undercover police officer. The pimp told the girls I wanted group sex. The policeman then handed her the money, and she started counting it. As soon as she acknowledged the funds, she was arrested. The door was shut. So the seven kids downstairs didn't know that an arrest was made until the uniform police turned up. My golden moment for the night was as soon as the pimp was arrested, I looked at the three girls. They all looked up at me with a smile. No words were exchanged, but they all sighed with relief and their eyes screamed, thank you. I smiled back as my eyes began to fill with tears, knowing these beautiful kids' lives were forever changed. Thank you for partnering with us to bring hope, healing, and freedom to these children. And just so you know more of what happens at this point, those girls are taken back to homes in those countries, um, kind of like group homes, and then they are taught skills. Um, there are sometimes there are sometimes additional negotiations worked out because sometimes these girls are working. Um, and then sending the money back to their families because their families are literally on the edge of poverty. Destiny and Rescue will do loans, will try to find ways to help support those families. There's a lot of just amazing good things that happen thanks to that organization. So just know that by supporting me here on the channel, you're also supporting Destiny Rescue. And I'm glad that we've been doing that for uh, well over a year at this point. Actually, we supported them back in 2017 also, but we made one large donation. 2018, we kicked it to a monthly and it's been going on ever since. If you want to help support them, and that includes you can buy jewelry actually made from some of the girls rescued, um, visit the link down below for Destiny Rescue. Check it out for yourself. Maybe you'll want to kick on a donation of your own. I'd really appreciate that. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day, and I'll see you back here on Friday with a brand new episode of Brain Scratch on the Lord and Arts channel. <laughs>